Rob and I have done a fair bit in property, but you know what? There's others that have done incredible stuff. And we love to get those people on the podcast. And this week, we've got a fantastic episode. This episode, you're going to hear the story of Mary and her journey as a property investor. It's a fantastic story. And as you'd expect, loads of ups, loads of downs, and most importantly, lots of lessons that we can all learn from. Welcome to the Property Podcast, where every Thursday morning, property investors come to be informed and inspired. Yes, really looking forward to getting into Mary's story today. It's a fantastic journey with so much to learn. So you're going to love that and make sure you stick around to the end because in Hub Extra, we're recommending a YouTube channel, which is an absolute must if you're interested in business. So it's time for our new story of the week. And this week's story appears on the BBC News website. And the headline reads, rent a reviction ban to finish at the end of May. So I'm sure as you listen to the Property Podcast and you have a passing interest in this subject, you're probably aware that since spring last year, you have been unable to evict tenants. And that has been understandable to a level because the world has been upside down. But at some point, it will have to end. And it appears, Rob, there is now a timetable for it to end. Yes, it's been extended multiple times, but now ending on the 31st of May. So what does that mean? It means evictions can actually be enforced. So if something gets as far as needing a bailiff visit, then they can actually turn up and do it. The other significant change here is that notice periods around evictions are being reduced as well. So the other thing that happened last year is that the normal two-month notice period for a Section 21 eviction was extended to six months. And from the 1st of June, that is being reduced to four months. And then the idea is that if everything goes to plan from the 1st of October, it'll be back down to its normal two months. So this is a difficult issue for the government because they'll be aware that there are people who will have arrears built up for one reason or another. There will certainly be a backlog of evictions once the ban is lifted. So it's going to be politically difficult. It's going to be actually difficult as well because there are going to be people going through nasty experiences. But at the same time, it couldn't last forever. It had to come to an end at some point. So we'll keep an eye on this over the coming months to see what plays out. And there's so much going on in property at the moment. So make sure you join us next week for the June, yes, I can't believe I'm saying that, the June market update. Already, it's looking like it's going to be a bumper episode. So next Thursday, we'll be bringing you all the latest and greatest news from the world of property. Don't miss it. Not going to lie, Rob and I are very happy just turning up and having a chat about property and having it broadcast. We've got no qualms rabbiting on about property for as long as it takes. But we also love hearing other people's stories, and we know that you do as well. So I'm really happy to bring you an interview today that we did with Mary Osman. Mary and her partner, Andrew, are architects turned property developers, and we're featuring their story in the latest issue of the Property Hub magazine. So if you are a subscriber to the magazine, you can go check that out and look at some lovely photos as well. If you're not, then sort that out go to propertyhub.net slash magazine they've been involved in commercial construction for about 15 years they're based in leeds and they've now moved into residential property building up a portfolio of hmos in both leeds and yorkshire more widely it's quite a journey that they've been on and we're going to follow that journey step by step starting with them stuck in the corporate rat race then their transformation to digital nomads to finally becoming hmo experts So they've had quite a journey and they've ended up in a fantastic place. But the beginning was not so exciting, but one that's familiar to a lot of people stuck in the corporate world and deciding that they'd had enough. We were just basically making other people richer and richer. (laughs) Uh, So we um, just decided to quit the job, really, and go traveling. Very in the very beginning, when we were traveling, we saw so many people who were you know, what you call digital nomads and we'd never, never come across anyone like that who was working away from. So we knew there was something like a different way to live. So uh, we kind of really wanted to pursue something that, you know, would allow us to work away from home and uh, living in Australia and everything. We took a a month's break and traveled around China. And while we did that, we basically, uh, the, the place we lived in Sydney, we rented it out for a month. Um, And it was a bit of a sublet, I'll be honest. (laughs) We basically thought, okay, we're going going away for a month. Let's just try to cover our rent. 
And Sydney is such a beautiful country, uh, city that around uh, you know Christmas time, so many people want to be there. So we rented it out for a month. It covered our rent, it covered our bills and everything else. And we were like, oh my God, this actually works. <laughs> So um, we got really excited about property. And whilst we were doing all of this, we got familiar with listening to property podcasts. And I absolutely loved listening to it whilst going to work in the morning and really got into, okay, property might be the way to go for us. Get this and understand this and, and work with this. So after a while of traveling, Mary and Andrew realized that there's an alternative to corporate life. So they began to educate themselves and made the very wise decision to start consuming podcasts. So while in Australia, they managed to put together a rent to rent strategy, a strategy that is often talked about in the UK and also known for being how difficult it is. But by doing that, they validated that property investment was probably the right thing for them. So how did they go from traveling China and subletting Australia to HMO development in Leeds? What was their strategy to get started? When we got back to the UK, we just really wanted to hit the ground running and start a property portfolio because we wanted to develop this eventual hands-off investment, get ourselves out of work, etc. cetera. Um, and we saw that as um, purchasing assets um, and then keeping them and renting them. Um, so, you know, buy, refurbish, refinance. And the HMO is something that obviously brings you a greater, normally it brings you a greater uh, income per month and a greater return on investment per month. So we were very interested in doing that. So coming back to the UK, rent to rent was a really big thing and rent to rent service accommodation was a really big thing. So for a year, that's what we did. We did rent to rent service accommodation and um, got, you know, a comfortable little portfolio of that. But as soon as we could buy our first property, that's what we did. So Mary and Andrew found themselves in Leeds and were gaining valuable experience and income from some rent to rent projects to get them into a position to make a purchase. But Leeds is a big place. So how did they work out where and what to buy? So things like that. I would say take the most amount of time. Knowing your area, I think it's the biggest challenge an investor can have, sometimes bigger than (laughs) revaluations, because you kind of want to perfect that area. You want to know that it really works. It works with a strategy that you want or either. So either you kind of pick a strategy that works for the area or pick the area that works with the strategy that you're after. And um, we invest in Leeds and the surrounding areas. And it took us months and months and months actually to realize and do our due diligence so we did loads of research I used to do lots of desktop research and then walking around and driving around the city and the different areas that we're interested in so our desktop research was anything to um, in understanding where students areas were where the article 4 areas were and so where there's restrictions and HMOs and things like that uh, to where kind of hospitals were where um, there was requirements for supply and demand. So I used to do lots of data scraping and every week I would uh, update the data um, to an extent that we've systemized it and now given it to our um, VA who works for us. So we've got a virtual assistant who actually does all the data scraping now. I'm a very cautious person. So uh, we make a very good duo, whereas Andrew's very brave and he'd go for a deal very quickly, whereas I'm very cautious and I want want to know that everything's correct before I go into a deal. So we actually do so much due diligence in an area in a space that before understanding it. So I think that's really important to do. But it's also good to have an Andrew to be like, right, that's enough. Let's just buy a house. (laughs) There we go. That magic word that you've probably heard once or maybe a thousand times on this podcast already. Research. Yeah, research is absolutely key. It's probably the most important thing you do as a property investor. And it sounds like they had it down to a fine art. What's also really important is their personalities really complementing each other. While Andrew may have rushed a little without Mary insisting on doing research, the opposite may have happened and Mary may have found herself stuck in analysis paralysis if Andrew wasn't there to move things forward. 
So now, by this point in our story, they've researched leads thoroughly and they're ready to make a purchase. But remember, they'd just been travelling around the world. They'd not had the most traditional of recent backgrounds. So what was it like getting finance? So in terms of finance, it was a matter of being here for a year. And as soon as you're here for a year or your completion basically aligns with a year, I think that that's all very comfortable. Another stumbling block that we had was that we wanted to buy our first property. Uh, we wanted to buy was a HMO and all lenders for HMOs, especially nowadays, they look for experience and they look for somebody who's experienced experience in rental so they know what they're doing and we didn't have experience in rental we didn't even have own our own property in our kind of personal name and again my motto kicked in and I was like I have to you know I want to do HMO I don't want to do a um, a buy to let and start small I want to start with a you know a bigger return on my investment pot so we actually got somebody who so it's a family member to come into our first purchase who basically she has experience in buying property and and rent, renting property and we basically she came in put her name down as okay you know I'll I will help you not financially but as kind of somebody with experience so you can actually go and buy your first HMO otherwise you most of the time you start with a buy to let and then you buy you move into a HMO and um, if you've got lots of history in the UK and if you've got you know pro- previously you've owned your own properties and stuff like that there may be one or two lenders but most lenders look for experience so strategy research and finance tick 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 all good now they're at a point where they've made a purchase. So how did this deal stack up? So it was a decent size refurb, our first uh, HMO. It was converting a three-bed house into a five-bed HMO and then converting the garage into the kitchen and lounge area, so the communal area. So we bought that property for 140000 So it was a and it's in an up and coming area. So it was a really good area to invest in because property prices were going up and there was lots of demand in there. We bought it for 140000 We did about, I think, just over 50K worth of refurb. So we were very cautious. We didn't go quite back to brick, but we did a rewire. We did replumbing. Uh, the, every bedroom is an ensuite bedroom. And then we did we converted the garage and the kitchen into a really big communal area. So it's a really fantastic space. We had anticipated for the refurb to take about three months, but that exaggerated. So I think it took an extra two or three months. And then after that, we got that revaluated to 220,000. So it was a really good revaluation. And we got, I think, an ROI of um 47 percent or something like that sounds good um surely for two highly experienced architects a refurb project of this size would have been a walk in the park right we had so many issues and you know the learning curve was so massive although we'd be both been architects and we had so many so much experience in big projects we actually didn't have that much experience in small projects so we were actually more lenient when things weren't quite right because we were used to much bigger problems <laughs> um so it, it was a real really weird learning curve actually but as soon as we got a hold of that and a hang of how that worked and actually a small project like that should work a lot more like clockwork and should work more smoothly which you know projects never do but you know we really got the hang of it and now we tend to project manage kind of our jobs we've we know loads of builders we know loads of specialists and stuff like that so we learned a lot from that project and we apply it to the new projects that we have so the new HMOs that we've got on site and everything like that we apply all of our knowledge onto the other projects getting a refurb started and completed can be really difficult especially when it's something you don't have a lot of experience with so we wanted to know what it was like for Mary and Andrew when they had to put together a build team on the first project we thought it would be a good idea to actually get a contractor involved 
um, who, you know, had his own builders and they would come together and um, we would kind of just visit once a week and make sure everything's all right and ticking well. To us, that didn't go that well, actually. And because we wanted particular things and we realized that, you know, visiting once a week didn't quite work. The contractor was kind of slowing down and we didn't quite have, you know, enough grip on the project. And we really wanted to manage the project and own the project and run it as fast as we can ourselves and realize that getting one contractor in to do lots of jobs and then him bringing other people in was not quite the right answer for us personally. So we, on the next jobs, we basically, so as soon as we got the second one, we decided to project manage ourselves and it worked so much better. Um, So that's when we got to know specialists and specialists are fantastic. So it's really good for everyone's projects to rather than bring in someone who can kind of do a bit of everything to bring in the people who are good at their skill specifically. So we got to know roofers, we got to know plumbers, we got to know electricians who would come in, like our electricians come in, three of them, do a first fix in one day and do a second fix in one day. And that's what we want. So while a project manager can be a godsend for some people, it obviously wasn't a great fit for Mary and Andrew. They preferred having control and running things themselves. But was that only an option because they were highly qualified and experienced architects? Because uh, we're architects, when we've got that kind of professional background experience, we produce our own Gantt charts and timelines of the project. And we basically, a month to three weeks in advance, contact everyone that we know, all the specialists, and book them in for those specific dates and more often than not it works out quite well they're available at those specific dates if not we kind of have backup contractors who would who would come and do the job so I think it is because of our experience and knowledge that we know who you know who comes at what part of the stage but I think a lot of that does come from experience there's sometimes like I was saying before because we did big jobs you know our experience with big jobs is more intensive and uh, then more contractors are involved so our first two jobs perhaps taught us a lot and for people who aren't architects I think it's that physical experience on the job and learning from your mistakes that really teaches you how how it works. So Mary and Andrew's background did play a part especially for the organization and time management but these are skills that many people listening will have and there's a bunch of transferable skills that you will have as an individual that you can take to the property world but even as Mary said it's the experience on the job even for architects where the real learning happens. They need to get the hands-on experience to be able to do this. Let's switch now and look at a different aspect of their story that's really interesting, which is Mary's drive to carry out projects like this in a way that's as environmentally friendly as possible. Now, this is a huge trend in all types of investing at the moment. I'm sure it's something that we'll see a lot more of in property in the future. So what kind of steps does Mary take to be as green as possible? I'm really passionate about uh, being green and, you know, studying architecture, you very quickly realise that 46% of work world's uh, pollution and emissions come from building construction and buildings in general. So you, you know that that's a huge amount of energy going into the atmosphere and we're not doing as as architects as designers and as inhabitants of this world we're not doing the world any favors at all and if we could do anything even like the smallest things that we could do to help combat that that's really really helpful for us we're really passionate about uh, being as green as possible so we do a at the beginning, at the rip out stage, anything that we can savor, we would put on Gumtree, we would put on eBay just for free. So, you know, fireplaces, wardrobes, anything that's kitchens that are left in the house that we, we think could be reused, we put on Gumtree or we, we put on somewhere so it could be taken and upcycled and recycled. 
Secondly, we uh, the companies that we get, so we don't tend to get a skip. We get uh, what we would call kind of like men with uh, like man in a van uh, who come and take all the waste um, at different times of the project. And we ensure that those companies actually recycle 95% of the waste that they take away uh, from the site. Because I think that's really important that it doesn't just end up in a landfill. Other things that we do as well is um, as soon as we get the property, we turn all the electrics into renewable electric. So um, electric and gas goes into a renewable supplier so that renewables only. So we actually move away from kind of the big names and go to the renewable suppliers and the renewable suppliers who offset your gas as well by planting new trees and things like that. And then during the refurb, we turn everything other than the central heating system into electric. So all the cookers, hobs and everything like that turns electric. But are all these steps just adding to the cost and therefore hurting the return on this investment project? Not substantially at all, actually. Really similar to what everybody else tends to pay. And as well, um, not using gas in most of your equipment is actually a little bit safer. So, you know, we have a better night's sleep <laughs> knowing that no one's left a gas hob on or something like that. So, um, so it's actually a really good feeling. And no, it really doesn't cost that much more perhaps a fraction but we haven't really noticed much of a change finally before we wrapped up we were really interested to hear about mary's philosophy about the end user the tenants it's been a real theme on this podcast over the last little while and we've heard it in interviews in the past as well about the slow death of the lazy landlord and more and more investors putting tenants first and giving them great spaces to call home so how do a couple of architects go about achieving this I'm a very big believer of giving tenants or giving anyone a really good space to live. So we actually call it a healthy, happy home. We we advocate great design, but not just great design for the sake of it, but great design that actually holistically makes you feel much better. So when you walk in through the door, it's your home and you feel that sense of calm coming back from work or coming from a hectic day or something like that. So they're as simple as the circulation that we create, you know, the storage facilities we have, for example, you walk in through the door, the colours and setting that we create is very calm. It's a really nice space to walk into. We've got every um, hallway, we actually have lots of shoe storage and stuff like that. So when you come in, you have a transition space, you have a space where your mindset changes, you remove your kinds of outer bit belongings and you walk into your home really and we really advocate you know creating design not and not for the sake of design but actually design that makes people feel much better so using colors using textures using furnishings in the right place and the right tones to make you feel much better and there's a real psychology to it and and we really love doing that and and we really love producing rooms that are big enough for tenants you know Sometimes we, we see in, in some, you know, properties, not great properties that we go into that the rooms aren't designed well, they're not very light, they're very small, the bathrooms are really cramped and the sinks are absolutely tiny. I don't know who can wash their face there. So, you know, we don't put huge bathrooms or on suites in, but we've put a really good size appliances, we put we put good size beds and everything like that in, reading spaces, desk areas in, just so people can feel really comfortable in the space that they're in and i'm sure we all know the answer to this but do these kinds of things improve the demand for the property so we do rent much higher in kind of in the in the market and not the highest because we actually want people to be able to rent <laughs> and you know we love having great tenants you know we're always kind of on top of we we keep an eye on the marketplace we rent our rooms at great prices and we get great tenants who stay longer with us because they love where they live and it's just so lovely to get messages from people saying that this was you know the best place they lived and um, they're really enjoying living there so it's just a really nice feeling to to understand that so there you go a step by step guide to going from architect frustrated with corporate life to becoming property investors and clearly 
loving what they're doing. Not an easy or straightforward journey, but hey, nothing like this ever is. Something that stood out for me, Rob, is that clearly their backgrounds are an advantage, but they're not essential. It's really easy to listen to something like this and go, oh, well, you know, they're an architect. Of course they can do that. It's easy for them. But not the case. Sure, they've got design skills that they can put into their projects. They're used to keeping projects on track using systems that they've developed previously. But Mary really emphasized how most of their success comes from experience in the real world. Just trying things, making mistakes, learning and trying again. Same as for anyone else. So having that background is definitely a leg up but not essential by any means yeah i mean we've said it in different ways over the years but you can listen to all the podcasts we've ever put out from start to finish but you'll do far far more learning when you actually invest no matter what your strategy is even just a normal buy to let you'll learn so much more by going through the process you learn by doing but something else we've also talked about on the podcast many times and it's glad that you know it's been reinforced here is the importance of research Again, architects, yeah, okay, you could go, we know it. But no, they, they know that research is so important. And of course, they have setbacks. We all will when we invest with things like finance or working alongside a project manager. But they haven't let it stop them. They've reassessed, altered course and moved on. But I like that they're also doing things their way and it's authentic to them, like trying to leave a small carbon footprint. You know, that, that's great that they've got their own thing and they're passionate about it. Yeah, definitely. It's great that they're doing that. And I'm sure that is with something we're going to see more of in the future as well. Something that we're already seeing a lot of, which is a great thing, and I'm sure we'll see even more of, is really having that focus on the end user, seeing tenants as clients and really caring about what they want rather than just giving them a really standard product as cheaply as possible. When was the last time you heard about landlords getting messages of thanks about a great place to live? It doesn't happen often, but clearly they're doing something right, which they obviously find personally rewarding. It's, it's something that they need to be satisfied with what they're doing but i'm sure they're going to be rewarded financially for that as well all in all i think that this story is such a great example of ordinary people finding themselves in a position where they're not so happy with how things are going and then doing the work to kind of lift themselves out of the tracks that they were on and put themselves on a different pathway putting in that time to do the research finding the route for them doing the work and then ending up in somewhere that they find more financially rewarding, but more personally rewarding as well. And as we've said, even though they had a background that was helpful, the success has just come from putting in the work. That's all it's taken. So if you're in a position like Mary and Andrew were at the start of their journey, there's nothing that they had that you lack. There's no reason why you can't do this as well. I find these stories so inspiring. So really glad to be able to share it. And thank you so much to Mary for taking the time to share her story with us. And a reminder as well that you can read more about this story and see some lovely photos as well in the latest edition of the Property Hub magazine. If you're not a subscriber yet, so you don't have that issued, well, don't worry. If you go and become a subscriber now, you'll get issued to all back issues digitally, including this one. So you're not going to be missing out. To start your subscription, just go to propertyhub.net slash magazine. So it's time for Hub Extra, the part of the show where we just want to give you a bit more value. And this week, well, it's a lot of value. We're only giving you the resource because the real delivery of value is in the resource itself. And it's a YouTube channel called Greylock. Greylock is a VC company, so they invest in startups and they've invested in some very famous startups. And there's a series going back from a few years ago that somehow I stumbled across called Blitzscaling. We'll link to it in the show notes. But the particular episode I'm picking out is an interview with Patrick Collinson and his experience of hiring at Stripe. This is back at 2015. Now, this was a small room. And back then, Stripe was a fast-growing, successful company. What they've gone on to today is astounding. They're a world leader when it comes to payments. What they are doing is truly incredible. So to have access to interviews like this when he was much earlier in his journey and being able to see what he was thinking about at that time for me is absolutely fascinating. But there are other videos as well on the Greylock channel that I'm sure you'll want to check out if you like the businessy type of resources. And of course, if you do, I can only assume that you're already subscribed to AOB, our other podcast. It's on a different feed. Search for any other business and you can listen to that as well and hear our thoughts on business and us talking about what we're going through as business owners. So the links to both AOB and this particular episode on YouTube you'll find in the show notes. Well, that is us done for another week. 
Thank you to Mary for taking the time to speak to us today. And thank you to you for listening. We really appreciate it. We'll see you for Ask Rob and Rob on Tuesday. Then we've got another great episode of the Property Podcast coming your way next Thursday. So don't miss it. Enjoy your week and we'll see you soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. 